I cut things a bit abruptly, maybe uh, uh, before continuing, were there any lingering questions from the first part? Uh, or maybe what I can do, let me just very quickly summarize the last point. So we've been studying this model, this uh, staggered dimerized model, and we've considered uh, in particular two cycles. This one here, which I call trivial, where all the quantities come back to themselves when the system returns to the initial state. Uh, and then the second cycle, which is it has this one here, where the bulk polarization, uh, sorry, <laughs> here, uh, changing continuously, so charge flowing through the bulk, uh, uh, so changes by quantum. Uh, and then since this, the system as a whole com came back to itself, that means that there has to be again some uh, surface state uh, crossing on the two edges to allow for the charge to tunnel from one end to the other so that the surface charge also is a periodic function. Uh, what is the difference between these two uh, 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 cycles? Uh, Essentially, as you probably guess, is that this one encircles a metallic point and this one doesn't. Um, so that's sort of a, one of those deep things that one can understand better as we go along. But, uh, uh, and it was mentioned yesterday, of course. Um, so, okay. So, um, so those are two things that we learned. But before I leave this figure, I want to mention one final thing that is kind of interesting, which is uh, if you look at theta equals uh, pi, the polarization is 0. OK? So let's now look at our phase diagram to understand where we are. So pi. Whoops. <coughs> So pi is this angle, so we are here, right? And now remember what these things are. So that means we are on the horizontal axis. So uh, beta, which is the hopping asymmetry, is 0, OK? So at that point, actually, the model looks simpler. So you still have the staggered on-site energies, but the hoppings are all the same. And let me also remind you where I chose to place my positive charges of my neutral system for which I'm computing the polarization. So um, coming back to the first day and to yesterday uh, afternoon, uh, the name of the game was symmetries. So what symmetry does this uh, system have that this one doesn't? <laughs> right. Uh, yeah, so, right. <laughs> I was hoping for uh, uh, the one that is relevant for what I'm discussing is inversion. <laughs> uh, um, so, polarization is a vector, right? Of course, here is just a scalar, but in some sense, is a, is a polar vector. Um, so if you reflect everything through this point, for example, it, the system comes back to itself, right? So the plus charges are mapped into their images. Um, the same thing with these uh, closed circles, these on side, these sides, and these also are. So everything is mapped back to itself, right? So the system is invariant under inversion symmetry, which I will call I. So makes sense. Oh my god, what happened? It's the wrong here. Makes sense that the polarization is zero, right? Because um, polarization being a polar vector goes into minus itself under inversion. Uh, and so if inversion is the symmetry of your system, that means that p equals minus p, so it's 0. So all is well, right? Yes? 
Uh, right, that was my next very good point. That's actually the whole point of why I'm bringing this up. What happens at t equals zero? Thank you. So, <clears throat> so t equals zero, we're also on the, on the same line where there is no hopping asymmetry. So this picture still holds. But if we look, uh, as you said, at that plot, the polarization is non-zero. So what's going on? Right? So that's the final surprise uh, that I want to mention in this business. So how can a symmetry argument fail? That's impossible, right? Symmetry is just one of those things that, uh, uh, mic you know, whatever you do microscopically, it has to, you know, has to comply with symmetries. So what is the flaw in the argument? Anyone that is not Antimo and <laughs> knows the theory of polarization very well can, has a hint. Uh, well, uh, let's, let's forget about, you know, I, I'm focusing on the blue line, which is supposed to be a bulk. Uh, uh, and this is, a, inversion is a symmetry of the bulk system. So somehow, yeah, it doesn't really. Um, it has to do with, um, with the fact that, uh, the bulk polarization is not a conventional vector quantity. Uh, it is a vector quantity, but it's multivalued. Okay? As we saw before. So we have to uh, revise the conventional symmetry argument. So the, the, the correct version of this argument that applies to a multivalued quantity is that uh, the bulk polarization and their inversion only has to come back to itself modulo E. Okay? Real space. So it's a symmetry of the lattice of the system, of the system of, uh, you know, electronic orbitals and ions. I'm just looking at this real space picture and uh, I stated that um, it has inversion symmetry across this point. And you're looking at the polarization point? No, the polarization is a property, it's a macroscopic property of the system as a whole. So, um, uh, the macroscopic uh, quantity, ve vector quantity that uh, is a property of the system somehow reflects the symmetries that that system has. And in particular, any vector quantity um, in a system that has inversion symmetry, um, you know, because it transforms uh, into minus itself under inversion, but if the system remains the same under inversion, that means that the two sides have to be the same thing. So this is the typical uh, uh, symmetry kind of reasoning that allows you to put constraints on observables. Yeah, so you just take your system and you, every point is mapped onto minus x, where I've chosen x equals zero to be this point. So that's called an inversion center. Well, because the system came back to itself, so uh, this operation didn't change the system. Right, so it has the same polarization. Because it's a microscopic property, it's a property of the entire system. So that's sort of why symmetry constrains microscopic properties. Okay? Uh, right, and so that's the thing. So uh, the polarization at zero is minus E over two. Uh, 
So if we, if we uh, change the sign, we get plus e over 2, which is the same as minus e over 2 modulo e, <laughs> right? Because if I subtract e, I get minus e over 2. OK? So uh, let me maybe describe it pictorically. Um, I said the, that the polarization is a multi-valued quantity. So if I have an axis where I uh, indicate what my polarization value is, then for a bulk system, I should not just put a dot on this line. I should put an entire lattice of points. OK, so I can put one here, and I can put one here, one here. Huh? And they are separated by E. OK? So uh, let this be 0. This is E to E minus E minus 2E. And so now the symmetry argument is that this lattice of values has to be uh, invariant under inversion. And it is, right? So now I'm just telling you how things are connected. And so every point on the lattice is mapped by inversion to some other point on the lattice. So the entire lattice is invariant. And uh, this is the case where P equals 0 mod E. That is the sort of unsurprising case. So that's the case that, oh, what happened? So that's the situation at, um, at uh, theta equals uh, pi. So that's the point there. Uh, but then the other possibility is that I have 0 here. But now my lattice looks like this. And this lattice of polarizations is also mapped onto itself by, uh, by inversion. OK? And these are the only two cases. So and in our model, that corresponds to theta equals 0. So what is the flavor of this? Uh, yeah, so right. So up, down, 0, 1, two values. So that's uh, uh, Z2 classification, right? So actually, on the basis of the polarization, the polarization can be used to classify all inversion symmetric insulators in one dimension into two classes. So those that have polarization 0 mod E and those that have polarization E over 2 uh, mod E. Um, now, if you remember the, uh, the lecture from yesterday uh, afternoon, this SSH model, this kind of model, was in this. Uh, I asked the question because I was confused. It was a uh, what was A3, right? Which was a uh, was a Z. But uh, but the point uh, is that uh, that table was for anti-unitary symmetries, right? And so, what, do I remember correctly? So so somehow um, you know inversion is a typical symmetry unitary. So so this classification is not part of that table. So there is no contradiction, and. Uh, uh, you know, and this model, just to be clear, this is a model 
of electrons and ions. So you have to specify where the ions are. So no. Oh, okay. Oh, no, that's right. I just meant that I, I wanted to make the comment that there was no contradiction with your table. Yes. To the? Yes, yes. Right. Right. Yeah, 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 yeah. sure. Mm. Right. Exactly. Yeah, that would be interesting, yes. Thank you, yes. So maybe in one dimension it's not so hard. I Yeah, right. Okay. So uh as you've heard, uh, and you probably many of you know, uh, one of the defining uh, things of topology is that uh, when you make uh, uh, smooth deformations, which is in this context means you don't close the gap, uh, you know, these invariant, uh, what it means that they are invariant is that they don't change. And to go from one phase to the other, you have to close the gap. To be precise, you have to close the gap if you go from one phase to the other, let's say the z2 odd, the non-trivial, to the z2 even, uh, the generic state, the general statement is that you're, you're guaranteed to, to go through a metallic point if you insist on preserving the symmetry. These are symmetry protected phases. So in this case, it's inversion symmetry, right? So what that means, so that's consistent with this phase diagram, right? So the inversion symmetric line is this line here. To the right of the origin, you have um, the, odd, the Z2 odd, let's call it. And to the left, you have the Z2 even. And at the boundary, you have the metallic point. So it works. Uh, of course, you can go from one to the other without going through a metallic point by breaking the symmetry. So that's allowed, so that there is no contradiction, and that's actually you know, the pump does that. Um, but uh, when we talk about symmetry protected phases and that uh, if you put two phases together, there is an edge, a metallic state or something that has, you know, uh, those two phases are supposed to have the same symmetry. So, uh, okay. Actually, uh, uh, I do have a question about your lecture uh, yesterday. So uh, at a generic uh, point uh, theta, let's say we are on the Z2 odd phase, which in this case is non-trivial. Uh, so theta is, uh, uh, maybe I got confused. Anyway, uh, so we don't have a, a state at zero energy at a generic point, right? Uh, um, so what we are guaranteed is that if we cycle, we're going to encounter, uh, let's say, a metallic state. But if you sit anywhere on this diagram, it's insulating. So I, 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 uh, that's fine, right? For, so, in the, so what I mean is that, uh, yeah, we have a, uh, a topological phase without uh, being, let's say, without having a metallic edge. Um, I guess. But if you put the two together, I guess, yeah. You must have. Yeah, maybe I'm getting confused. Sorry. Uh, anyway, in this, it is clear that if we do the cycle, we do have to go through a metallic, a metallic state. And also here. 
Yes. Right, right. Well, um, you have a macroscopic uh, charge at the surface of an uh, inversion symmetric system. No, only in one of them. You have a, a, a half an electron net half electron charge bound to the surface of this uh, uh, of the system on this state. Yeah. Which is, I think, is unexpected. It's a little surprise. Uh, no, naively would expect to have zero, I think. Uh, hmm? Mm. Yeah, so in the end, you know, it's, it's, it works out, but, uh, but you know, in, in the, I think it's interesting that there are two classes of inversion symmetric systems, those that have, that can have in multiples of an integer charge at the surface and, uh, and half integers. Yeah, I think it's, it becomes, yeah, it's maybe unexpected at first, but then it starts to make sense. Okay. Um, okay, let's uh, um, proceed. And uh, so far we've been talking about the finite system, uh, but we've argued that uh, in some funny way, the polarization is a bulk property. Uh, so that means that if we get rid of the edges by uh, switching from open to periodic boundary conditions, like we like to do in condensed matter physics, in solid state physics, uh, we should still be able to define and calculate uh, polarization and all these quantities we've been discussing, right? So that's what I would like to do in the second half. Uh, that is going to be our theme. And that's where various phases are going to appear. Uh, but uh, maybe the take home message from the first part is that uh, we were able to uh, learn a lot of things and even topology uh, without mentioning berry phases, which is, you know, I love berry phases, they're beautiful. But uh, uh, I also like to have this real space picture to think about, you know, uh, what that beautiful but abstract concept means in terms of just charges moving because, you know, that's what it's about, really, or where they are. And uh... OK. So the question for most of the talk, for the, for the most of the session is, you know, our definition of the bulk contribution to the electronic polarization was just um, the center of a Vanier function for example, the one at the middle of the chain, let's call it zero, that gave the electronic contribution. So the question I want to, to address uh, for the next uh, minutes is how to define this under periodic boundary conditions. And at some level, it may sound like an academic exercise, but remember, uh, I don't need to remind most of you, but you know, uh, periodic boundary conditions are very important because there is Bloch's theorem that uh, reduces the computational cost a lot, for example, uh, among other things. So whenever possible, we want to, to compute things under periodic boundary conditions. And so this is a fundamental quantity in the physics of ferroelectrics and so forth, and now even some topology. So uh, we definitely want to be able to, to, to do that. So what I w want to do next then is to introduce Vani functions for periodic systems.
Okay. Maybe I can go a little bit uh, fast, not write everything. So, um, well, let's. Um, can I, see, see. Yeah, let me just do a small change of notation, very small. Um, so I've been calling my Vani functions of the finite chain. I call them Ws, right? They were the eigenfunctions of that um, projected position operator. It is there in equation four. So these were what I called Vani functions. Um, and uh, in uh, real space, they were just periodic images. So the ones in the bulk were just periodic images of the one uh, in the central cell. So now, in, uh, when we talk about periodic systems, we, we like to define lattice vectors. So that's typically R. So R equals JA. And I will simplify the notation. So from now on, the funny functions, I, I'm just going to call them R ket. Just uh, so before, you know, they were labeled by J, and now they're labeled by R, which is the same thing. So in a periodic system. Uh, and, the, and the one in the home cell, uh, I'll just call it zero, but this is not a zero state in some second quantization, it's just the Vani function in the, in the center, central cell, in the home cell, let's say. And uh, so how do we define uh, the Vani function? So the Vani functions are not the eigenfunctions. They were not for the finite chain already. That's why they, we solved a, a different eigenvalue problem. Now the eigenfunctions are the block functions, right? So those are the psi case. So the, the quantum number is the wave vector in the Bruno zone k. And, uh, and the transformation from one to the other is again a unitary transformation, like before. Uh, but it takes this, this form, is an integral over the Bruno zone uh, from 0 to 2 pi over a. Uh, and then you just integrate the psi of k, but with a k-dependent phase factor, e to the minus i k dot r. OK. Oh, thank you. Uh, I'm, throughout this presentation, I'm always assuming that uh, I have an insulator with a single valence band, and my state is in the valence band. So typically, we need an extra band index to, to label the Vani functions in the same way that a band-like index, in the same way that there is a band index for the bands. But in this case, I don't use that index. Even though my model has two bands, I only construct the Vani functions for the lower one. OK? Right. OK, so that's the block to Vanier transformation. And the second equation is the inverse. So it's the uh, Vanier to block. And maybe just. <laughs> Uh, as a simple exercise, let's check the consistency of the two. So the sides are the eigenfunctions. Uh, where now H this is the kinetic energy and this is the periodic potential. So the typical setting for crystals, uh, electrons and crystals. So let's check the consistency. So let's, for example, plug the first equation into the second. I think it's good to do this uh, at least once. Probably many of you have, but it doesn't hurt to see it again. Um, So I'm going to bring the integration up front. And all the integrals are from 0 to 2 pi over a, so I will be sort of relaxed about that. Um, and now I have my summation. Um,
Okay. And now, um, if you look at this quantity here, um, when k equals k prime, you're adding a large number of uh, unity. So you're going to get something very large. And I think it's plausible that when they are different, you're, you know, the phases get randomized and uh, you're going to get destructive interference and you get zero. Uh, but actually, you can prove that this is one, one way of writing the delta function. And uh, for example, uh, if you want to refresh your memory, um, I think, uh, yeah, maybe one of the appendices of Ashcroft and Marmin goes through this kind of thing, like appendix F or something. Uh, it's all there somewhere. OK. So anyway. Uh, now, um, sometimes we want to replace integrations by summations, so we discretize our case space. Uh, and uh, I always forget how these things go, so I have this. I've put a little table like to remind me uh, of the equivalences. Um, uh, and the reason is that for certain manipulations, it's easier to work in the discrete uh, formulation for others in the continuum. So, so for example, you can rewrite, of course, the the relation between the block and the finite functions now in discrete in the discrete case. Um, and they look like that. So that's sort of like something to, to help us as we go along. Um, OK, so, and here I think I just, I can flash it because of course everybody knows this. Block's theorem, everybody in this room, uh, means that, uh, states that when you change uh, the argument of the block function x by a lattice constant r, the block function does not come back to itself almost, but up to a phase factor e to the i k r. And then what you can do is introduce a new definition, which is the, uh, the function u, which is related to psi by that equation. And if you plug in that definition, you see that actually the u does come back to itself um, precisely under a lattice translation. So that's so psi k is the block function and u is the so-called cell periodic part uh, of the block function. Okay. So what are the, uh, I'm trying to be careful, so let me go through things that seem trivial, but they do play a role. So orthonormality relations. Um, if you take two um, block functions, with different uh, wave vectors. They are different uh, eigenfunctions of the same operator, so they have to be orthogonal, right? So, um, and the way I'm going to write my orthonormality relation is like this. And so, for example, here I want to work in the discrete case, which I find more intuitive. So this is a Kronecker delta. And I've put an n up front, where n is the number of k points. And what I mean by this is that when I have block states and I have these brackets, this means an integral over all space, just a convention, which under periodic boundary conditions means an integral over n cells. Okay? And so by writing this, what I'm really saying is that the integral is over all cells, but the block function is normalized over a single cell. So when you integrate over n cells, you, know, you get n times the Kronecker delta. So that's it. Um, um, right. And I will leave as an exercise, but from this, and using equation, uh, let's say, the discrete form, so equation 9, uh, you can convince yourselves, and I'll skip that in the interest of time, that, uh, and this follows from that, okay? So this has been my convention, but now this is a consequence that um, divine functions are also an orthonormal set, but whereas the block functions uh, are normalized over a unit cell, divine functions are normalized over all space. So now I don't have an N here, okay?
Okay. Um, so that is the first property of Vanier functions, the orthonormality. The second property that I want to uh, mention uh, is that, and maybe I can do that here. Is that the Vanier functions are periodic images of one another. So hence, using the same name as before for the finite chain where we encountered a similar property. So um, let me go to the position representation and call the Vanier function again W, but W of R instead of W of J as before. Uh, So this is equation nine, right? The first of equations nine. Um, but this, using Bloch's theorem, equation 10, is just one over n psi k of x minus r, right? So it's sort of Bloch's theorem, but replacing x plus r with x minus r. So to, to account for this sign here, right? But what is this? Look again at equation nine and set capital R to zero so that the exponent disappears. That's precisely this, right? So this is the wave function at R equals zero, the Vanier function at R equals zero, X. So back to the, um, uh, sorry, x minus r, because the argument is x minus r. So the Vanier function labeled by r is the same as the Vanier function labeled by zero, but shifted by a lattice vector r. Okay, so just to motivate that this, this definition has everything to do with the definition that we used in the first part of the talk for finite systems. Uh, what about the use? So now I want to bring up something interesting. Um, so we talked about orthonormality relations for the size. We talked about uh, the relations for the, for the, for the, so the block functions, the Vanier functions. But what about something like this? So what is this? So is it something like this? Sorry? The use. The use, yeah. So what about you? Should be an N in the front. Okay, so actually let, let me come to that. So the use are uh, cell periodic. So actually I'm going to use a different convention. Whenever I have these inner products with use, my convention is that the integral is over a single cell, just because it's a cell periodic. So that's a pure convention. So there should not be an N in the front. But so what about the Kronecker delta? So uh, to answer that question, let me uh, come back to the Schrodinger equation, OK? Let me rewrite this Schrodinger equation in terms of the use. I can do that because the size can be written in terms of the use, right? So I just write H e to the i kx uh, u of k equals e of k times e to the i kx u of k. It's the same equation, but I just written, replaced psi with the expression in terms of u. And now what I want to do is to bring this exponential, it's just a number, well, operator, I guess, yeah, to that side. Uh, so 
so that it looks more like a conventional eigenvalue equation for the use. Actually, it is precisely an eigenvalue equation for the use. But what you see is that um, this plays the role of the Hamiltonian now, right? So let me call this age of k. So why, why was this 0 when k was different from k prime at some very basic level? Of the same Hermitian operator. Right? So now, if I solve this eigenvalue equation at k and k prime, I'm solving an eigenvalue equation for different Hamiltonians. So actually, there is no reason for this to be to vanish uh, when k is different from k prime. It's just an overlap between two different cell periodic functions. You know, in a sense, the, the block states live in orthogonal Hilbert spaces because you can think of that phase factor in Bloch's theorem as a sort of a twisted, a generalized periodic boundary conditions where the wave function comes back to itself, model of phase. So a different case, the Bloch functions obey different twisted boundary conditions. So they live in orthogonal spaces. The U's all live in the same Hilbert space. They all live in the space of uh, perfectly periodic functions. So they are happy to, you know, the overlap uh, is nothing funky. So actually, this is the U's are going to play a much bigger role in, in my story than, uh, than, than the size. And that's basically the reason. You know, uh, we're going to encounter, you know, uh, at some point, we're going to need overlap between nearby states. And then we do, uh, actually, we even have to have things like this. Uh oh, I really don't want to write the berry phase, but we're not so far. But these things are well defined, right? The derivative of a periodic function is a periodic function, and it has a non zero overlap with some other periodic function. But this is fine. But something like this just doesn't cut it. I mean, what is this? Nothing. I mean, it's. Right. Yes. So do you understand going from here to here? OK. And so uh, the conclusion is that the eigenvalue problem that the U's satisfy uh, is a very similar problem to this one. You have some Hamiltonian. But the difference, the key difference, is that the Hamiltonian has a parametric dependence on this number k. So you know the general statement from quantum mechanics is that two eigenstates of the same Hermitian operator are orthogonal. But two eigenstates of different operators don't have to be orthogonal. So that's the point. And now, uh, since I did mention Berry phases, uh, let me uh, sort of follow up on this comment. The general setting of Michael Berry's paper is, I think probably the first line of the paper, is imagine a system that depends on some parameter. And you take that parameter on a closed loop. Maybe you've seen that. So it's very likely <laughs> that you can see various phases related to use because you have a natural. So in solid state physics, we have a built-in parameter space. Typically, Barry thought of as the, um, yeah, the parameters connecting the system to the rest of the universe. Somehow, yeah, it's connecting the system to the lattice. But so it's all built-in. In our system of elections and ions, the, there is a sort of a built-in parameter, which is the Brunel zone. Okay? So I, I sort of got ahead of myself, but uh, that's, that's, the, that's the spirit of the thing. OK. Um, remind me when I have to stop. I keep erasing it. 105, right? Yeah, OK. Um,
So uh, what are the properties of this uh, space? So this is a reciprocal space or K-space. Uh, the key property is that things tend to be periodic on this space. So, um, so the periodicity in real space translates into some periodicity in, in K-space. So we all know that the energy bands uh, are periodic. So, and what that means is that we can actually label all the independent states with wave vectors k lying on a range of k values of size 2 pi over a. And that's the first real zone. We can also choose 0 to 2 pi over a, as I've done before. So you know, it's, it really doesn't matter. Um, and really, so uh, if you solve uh, at this point and you solve at this point, you're solving the same problem. So you're solving the same eigenvalue problem. So if you solve it twice, you solve it today and you solve it tomorrow, you should get the same result, right? Actually, not quite. In quantum mechanics, you're allowed to, to change the phase, right? So the wave vectors are only defined up to a phase. So the eigenvectors. So that means that actually, in all generality, um, we are allowed to, um, to write something like this. Meaning, no one prevents from doing that. But because this gauge phase, so-called gauge phase, is arbitrary, also not, no one prevents us from sort of setting a rule that we all agree from now on, that we're going to choose this gamma to be zero. I just want to emphasize that it's a choice. Okay, and this I'm going to call a periodic gauge. So, of course, the uh, the eigenvalues are always uh, periodic, even when we don't make this choice. So this choice has to do with the periodicity of the wave functions themselves in K-space, and so. For the rest of this uh, uh, presentation, we're going to accept as a, as a choice that uh, this condition is, is satisfied. And now, a little surprise, maybe, which is uh, once we accept that, so now I should <laughs> take away this, uh, the use, what happens to the use? So, you know, they are not independent. So we, we just have to plug the use there and see what happens. Uh, so just look at that equation there on the projector. So this is something uh, that is... Uh, may seem confusing at first, which is the, the U's are periodic in real space, but actually in the periodic gauge, they are not periodic in case space. Uh, so they, there is this phase factor here. And that just follows from that and the definition of the U's. Okay? So, uh, there it is. Okay, so something to keep in mind. Is that okay? Yeah. So this is the periodic gauge condition for the use. Okay, so I, I just wanted to set the, the rules of the game and now we can proceed. So let's go back to the problem that we really want to solve, which, uh, as you may remember, we wanted to compute the polarization or the electronic part of the polarization which is given by the charge or the uh, center of mass of a Vanier function. Okay. So let's see. Uh, yeah.
and that was uh, what we call the internal coordinate inside the unit cell. So that was now in our revised bulk notation is just the expectation value of x over the Vanier function in the central cell. Okay. So I basically what I want to do is to rewrite this in terms of block functions using those transformation between Vanier and block. So let's divide it into two parts. So let me do this part first. So let me just, um, so again, uh, I want, so now I want to switch to the, from the Dirac notation just to the position representation since I have an X there anyway. So I want to look at X acting on a funny function W0 of X. Okay. So, I use the definition and now for this particular argument it's more convenient to work with continuum k so with equation 8 with setting r equal capital r equals 0 in equation 8 for this w okay so we have a over 2 pi integral I'll skip the limits uh, no actually I won't skip the limits sorry for the moment uh, now I have x there and now, and I, I just want to replace the size with the use, so I have an e to the i k x from equation 10, uh, u k of x. Okay. And now here's another trick, which is um, this guy. This can be written as minus i dk e to the i k x. This is just a condensed notation for a derivative, uh, right? <laughs> okay. So once we have derivatives and integrals, what can we do? Integration by parts, right? So let's do an integration by parts. And as usual, we get two terms. Um, let me do the new integral first and the boundary term second. So the new integral is where the derivative acts on the other guy. But there is a sign change. So instead of minus i, I have a plus i. Let me keep it outside of the integral. And now I integrate from 2 over the Brillouin zone, dk. Um, and now I have the exponential e to the i k x. Um, and now I have i d k acting on the u. Mm -hmm. Oh, by the way, I've also gone back to the direct notation. So sorry. <laughs> so this is now x zero. Is that? Uh, plus the boundary term. <laughs> did I did make a, a mistake here? Oh, yes, you're right. Too many eyes. Uh, so actually, let me keep it there. Thank you. Plus the, the boundary term. Um, is minus i a over 2 pi psi k of x. So in this case, I want to go back to the full psi, just for convenience. And then that is at the limits of the integral, which were 0 equals 2 pi over i. Right. So now you see why I wanted to choose a gauge where this condition is satisfied. <laughs> because it just allows us to drop uh, the boundary term. But my point is, you could work in a generic gauge where you had this phase factor, but then you always have to bring, you know, carry with you this, uh, this boundary term, so you cannot throw it away. But since there is a gauge choice where it goes away, that's obviously the smart uh, choice to make. Okay. Okay. 
So, you know, this actually sort of looks kind of intuitive. So, um, I've replaced an x by an i grad k. It's sort of like the reverse of, you know, position momentum, but now it's crystal momentum. But, um, okay, that is the, let's say that's this object here, but now I want to take an, uh, an expectation value, so I want to put now the funny function on the left hand side also. So let's write the full matrix element and see what we get. So again, I have to use the definition of the Vanier function. So I already had an a over 2 pi that gives me another one. So I have a over 2 pi squared. And now I have a double integral, 1 over dk and 1 over dk prime. And now, oh, sorry, one important thing that I forgot. Uh, I want to introduce another definition. Sorry about that. Uh, Let me call this guy gamma, oh, oh, sorry, uh, including the exponential, gamma k. Uh, this function walks and talks like a block function. So a block function is uh, e to the i k x times a periodic function, the u. This gamma is e to the i k x times a periodic function, because the derivative of a periodic function is a periodic function. So for many purposes, this guy behaves like a psi. It's just not an eigenfunction, but uh, it lives in the same Hilbert space. Let's put it like that. And so um, that means um, that I can write uh, my uh, expectation value is psi k prime gamma k. And remember for the size, this is an integral over all space. Right? OK. Uh, so what does this give us? So remember our discussion about orthonormality and so forth. So when k prime is different from k, these two block-like states, one a block eigenstate and another, some other state which is not an eigenstate, but uh, uh, behaves like a block state. These kinds of overlaps are zero unless uh, k is equal to k prime. So now let me momentarily switch to discrete. I prefer this argument in discrete. So, but always keep in mind that little table there so one can always go back and forth. So there should be a delta k, k prime there somewhere, right? So when k prime is different from k, these guys are orthogonal spaces. Um, now, for the block states, when k is equal to k prime, we just got an n because they were the same state. In this case, so let's pick, uh, put an n because the integral is still over all space. But if k is equal to k prime, the phase factors are the same but with an opposite sign because one is a bra and a cat. So it's really an integral of two cell periodic functions. That's it. So it's like an, uh, an inner product of the u and of the derivative of u. So, but another way of saying it before doing that is that this is just the same integral over a single cell. In other words, when k equals to k prime, this function is periodic. So integral over n cells is the same as n times the integral over one cell. And when k is different from k prime, you get zero because they are orthogonal. They are, I mean, they are different twisted boundary conditions. Okay. So um, back to this guy. 